Hey there. Uh, my name's Alex Hansen. I am the director of Alio Games, and uh, I'm the designer behind Morse. Uh, and me and the team at Alio have been working on this game for a good while now. Um, it's kind of, Morse has generally been in the ether for about, I would guess, seven, eight years, but only really taken up proper development in the last couple. And um, yeah, over the pandemic, we developed this one hour vertical slice of gameplay um, that we're really, really stoked to be included in uh, Ludo Narakon, which we've very kindly translated into Morse code here. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm going to be giving a playthrough of the game, talking about the narrative elements and themes, um, and giving you just kind of like an essence of what the game is about and what it's like. Um, accompanying the experience, we're also going to be using this wonderful bespoke custom controller um, that was developed by myself and Katie Marshall, um, which you know consists of a lovely little telegraph key, uh, a spring-loaded operation, a spring-loaded button that you can use to call down artillery strikes, and these uh, I don't know if you can see them from here, these 1930s uh, Bakelite headphones, um, which. You know, according to someone I met at a conference recently, um, were actually used during the Second World War by telegraphists. Um, hope you know, and it's kind of awesome that we've got them like working retroactively with uh, um, actually able to hear audio through these. Um, and yeah, it's kind of bizarre to think that the last time that these were used was potentially um, during a world war. Um, hopefully, that is still going to be a thing of a past. Uh, I guess we'll see. Um, let's delve in. Uh, just before we start off, I just want to say that um, what we've produced here is effectively a vision of what we want the final game to become. Um, there's so much that we want to bring to the kind of the final experience, um, but hopefully this gives you enough of a, um, a taste of, of what's to come and um, to kind of pardon our dust. That you know, the, the, there might be things that are still kind of a bit broken with it, um, or you know, kind of need further development. So please do keep that in mind. Um, and, you know, I love getting feedback and, and insight on the game, so feel free to get in touch if you have any, any thoughts. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hop straight into the training mode, um, and then we'll, once we've kind of dabbled around in that a little bit, we'll hop into the story. So uh, the Morse is kind of made up of two parts. So you've got the kind of campaign element, and then you've got the training mode, which is effectively... Um, a scenario that you can oh nice uh, it's a little scenario where you can kind of play endless numbers of um, missions uh, to kind of train yourself up with Morse code um, this is Ida this is our main character um, as you'll very quickly meet this is Eliza who is another one of the main characters um, this game was um, has ink as its kind of underlying uh, structure for um, narrative elements so you know we found it really really useful um, as, a, as a tool for us to be able to um, mock up narrative elements relatively quickly um, and then the game itself is built in unity um, so as part of this um, training mode we've, we're have basically using isograms which are words with non-repeating letters and um, yeah like those are used to kind of like define the different map types uh, and we have a pick of either 600 curated words or 15,000 uh, complete, like more or less ra you know, random words. Although I have gone through and I've filtered out some of the uh, kind of more distasteful <laughs> words. Um, so yeah, let's just kind of hop in and I'll give you a rundown of kind of roughly how the game works, and then we'll we'll, we'll dive into the game. What a perfect word to begin with. Um, so um, you, as the player in this game, are effectively relaying uh, coordinates. Um, you know, via telegraphy to kind of call down artillery strikes on, on the battlefields of Europe. Um, so, and the way you do that is you have your list of Morse code on the left hand side here, and then you have your Morse code button here, and then you have your launch button. Um, I'm not going to be using these buttons, but I'll just show you that they do work, so you can just click on that and it inputs. I'm instead going to be using this controller here, so I'm just going to reach around and put this in. Working fine. So, um, yeah, Morse is made up of dots and dashes. Uh, they're kind of the two main components of it. And you can use those to um, make up to 30 different inputs 
with you know, oh, so actually over 30 different inputs with just one, you know, one or two button touches. So, for example, I'm going to do the letter A here, which is made up of a dot and a dash. And you can see that the little target reticule moves across. Uh, think of it almost like typing of the dead meets um, telegraphy. Um, so you can see I just called down my little artillery strike there. I'm going to move back to E. Um, you get different shell types as part of the game, so um, you can target multiple squares and stuff like that. So, so that ship sunk. Uh, let's go to I. Um, one thing that's wonderful about Morse code is that you have um, a tree structure to it. So you start with one dot, which is E, and then you get two dots, which is I, and then three dots, which is uh, S. And from that, you can kind of slowly build up a knowledge of, of, of the language um, in a rel relatively scalable way, um, which is really nice. Um, one of the biggest challenges to the game was um, how to teach a language at the same time that you're teaching a game. And um, it's been a really interesting experience, like a lot of kind of tutorial design and um, yeah, figuring out how to kind of make things as readable and clear as possible. So I'm just going to polish off a couple of these missions and then we'll dive into the campaign. So as you can see, these are kind of random words that we're having selected here along the bottom. Um, these are essentially like uh, just randomized strings. Um, they're what, what are known as isograms, which are words with non-repeating letters. Um, and yeah, like those can be used to um, generate maps with in the final game, we're kind of hoping that we'll have almost like a seed structure where you can have like a specific word that will be always be like a specific mission. Um, let's skip this one. This is a bit of a rubbish map. Again, the, the training mode is, is still relatively new, so uh, sometimes you get duds. Um, oh, this is a gorgeous word. Okay. Um, so you can see we've got two rows here. So um, most letters are up to four uh, digits. Uh, so, like, for example, P would be uh, at four digits. Oops, that's not P. That's L. Uh, and then numbers are five digits. So you've got a kind of like a battleship style uh, grid system to be able to control the game with. Uh, let's go to A. Uh, you, you can move wherever you want on the grid, so it's, as I said, it's kind of like typing the, of the dead or like Guitar Hero, um, you know, like Morse Hero. <laughs> um, so, let's just finish off these two more, and then we'll dive into the campaign. Um, one of the, the ambitions that I had as part of this project was designing a game that has a compelling narrative, and an interesting campaign, but also holds interest and can be a compelling experience beyond um, just you know, you know the campaign itself. Um, you know, so let's uh, nip back to the menu and let's uh, delve into the campaign. So one thing that I really like as part of this is that I've got it. So um, you know, hard mode is kind of in Morse code for you. Um, yeah, and I've had some fun ideas about how that's unlocked. So let's dive in. So the basic narrative premise of Morse is that, um, you know, this is again set in the First World War on a fictional black site, um, which is, is basically like a, a covert military base. Um, and as part of the, the world wars that have occurred, um, there's always been these kinds of sites that have done kind of covert ops and things like that, places like Bletchley Park. Um, and there's many of the people that worked there, um, uh, for example, the Wrens, who uh, took the knowledge of those sites to their graves um, because of, you know, the Official Secrecy Act and because of um, censorship. And, you know, this game is, is it, that gives us a degree of creative freedom because we can use that context to be like what if nobody found out about one of these sites like you know what if, what if there are like sites like this that existed that everybody kept silent um and, and yeah there's a lot of creative freedom there to kind of come up with ideas for different um uh diff different 
uh, stories that you can kind of come up with, uh, but also still ground them in a, in a historical setting. All right, so this is Sturch. Um, welcome to Burke House, which is the, the, the place that the game is set. Um, one, one thing that is uh, uh, quite has been quite interesting about developing this game is from using ink, uh, we've been able to uh, take advantage of the uh, the parsing tools within that. Um, there might be some people, the people who um, this is kind of gobbledygook for, but I, I'm a teacher, so I love explaining this stuff. So, like having certain words in the script that's being written that that trigger certain events. It, you know, in the actual um, sequence. So, for example, uh, the camera is currently moving between the two characters. So, based on who's speaking, there'll be a tag that will check for the word Ida, or will check for the word Sturch. And based on what tag is there, it'll it'll move the camera. Um, and you know, Danny, who was who's the writer on the project, um, it was really really good. It was a really really enjoyable experience to to give. Her more tools to kind of shape the narrative, um, which just required like almost like a director's director's notes to kind of trigger things like uh, camera movements or uh, zooming the camera or things like that. And as we develop the game further, that's something that we want to significantly expand to you know having it so you almost kind of construct like a, a doll's house setting where it's like you know you're in the lounge. There's three characters here. It's raining outside, and um, you know there, there's this maybe some music playing in the background, or have like certain audio cues play. Um, there's a lot of potential there to, to kind of take work, oh, take take work away from me, um, take take essentially take work away from me, and give it to someone else. Uh, but that also empowers them to be able to. Um, create their own work, you know, kind of uh, be increasingly creative. So um, this is the kind of like overworld view of, of uh, Burke House. Um, this is where you'll kind of like navigate between different spaces. And um, we're going to nip to the tea room. Uh, one thing to mention that's quite cute before we go forward is you can see that we've got these little bull, you know, this is essentially like a notice board. And um, yeah, over the course of the game, there's like events occur and, and change. We want these messages to kind of adjust or kind of uh, posters and, and a context for the time uh, want to be displayed on, on these walls. Um, so this is one of the kind of voluntary narrative sections that you can choose to uh, take part in. So this is Kitty. Uh, this is one of the main characters, one of, one of the, the kind of the, the characters uh, that you'll be interacting with in the house. Um, one thing that's quite uh, important as part of the game is that um, we didn't want to build a game that was like massively branching and have these like, you know, uh, forking uh, narrative struts. Um, we made a very conscious choice early on to design something that was a very kind of focused, almost like visual novel style structure. Um, you know, where the variety in narrative is, is the, the kind of choices, you, subtle choices you make in conversation um, and the choice that like who you interact with in the house. Um, for me, I would, I would rather design like a rich narrative experience, uh, you know, kind of historically grounded, rather than something like a, um, a broad, shallow uh, uh, experience with lots of choices. Um, and one of the things is as well is that, you know, during the First World War, um, there's a lot of habit, you know, in media and things like that to kind of make it appear that like one person is like the pivotal decider of, you know, the, the outcomes of these conflicts. And, um, you know, in reality, it was, it was the collective action of, of thousands of millions of people, um, you know, and in particular people who weren't fighting on the battlefields. Um, there's been a lot of media that's portrayed, you know, kind of brothers in arms and you know, people fighting on the the the, the, um, the war front, but it's very rare to, to get media that depicts uh, the war front or um, people on the other end of you know the, the communication wires. Um, you know, what were their stories and what were their experiences? Uh, so this is Eliza. Uh, this is one of the 
uh, main characters that you'll be kind of interacting with as part of the game. Um, she's also the love interest of Ida. Um, and, you know, for that, for me, that was like a particularly kind of exciting element to explore, um, given the kind of the, the overlap with the themes of the game. Like one of the main themes is secrecy. And obviously at the time um, there was a significant amount of like discrimination that existed uh, surrounding queer people, you know, particularly working in like, institutions like the military, and um, as a telegraphist as well. Um, you know, tele as part of telegraphy, one of the main um, skill or kind of skills or um, traits that you can have is uh, discretion. So you're keeping the secrets of the people that you work with, the secrets of your clients, things like that. Um, and yeah, there's a, a quite a significant overlap with um, the need for discretion that um, queer folks have had to have during their professions uh, working in the military. Um, so yeah, that that that's going to be what quite an interesting theme to explore, um, and we've got some quite wholesome ideas for how that this um, romance is going to unfold. Um, so Dotty is the machine that is uh, the main machine that you're going to be working with. Um, this is effectively, again, this is a fictional setting, but historically grounded. This is, uh, a, a, there was a machine known as the Difference Engine, which was like a, a early computer that was developed in the kind of late 1800s, and um, it was never actually manufactured. So this is kind of like a, um, a history where, not kind of an alternate history, where this machine came to be and was used to kind of, um, used by artillerists uh, to kind of call down artillery strikes on, on the battlefields of Europe more precisely to try and tip the war in favour. Um, so we're going to do the first uh, little mission here. Um, so that's going to be let's give a sec. Uh, this little training mission. Obviously I've just shown you how the game works but you'll be able to see how the tutorial works for this game. Um, so I'm just going to hop over to the help sheet. You've got your list of letters. And um, yeah, I'm just going to blast through this. Like designing this UI was like so much fun. Um, like designing the little dot dash threshold here um, was very, very satisfying. Um, I'm just trying to find ways to articulate um, the difference between the two as kind of clearly as possible. Um, uh, one thing I haven't really gone into too much is you get your shells loaded in from the right hand side here. And um, yeah, uh, depending on what shell you have loaded, uh, that depends like what area of effect you have, um, and you know how you, how you can target different units. So I'll just polish off these last few. So yeah, we. Oh, whoops! I was using my mouse there. I wasn't using the controller. Okay, <laughs> I'll do it for the next mission. I promise. Um, so. Uh, something to mention as well, you've uh, got this quite um, minimalist environment in the background. Um, this is something that we do want to kind of continue through for the for the, the full game, um, predominantly because like uh, it gives like a level of cohesion. But um, one of the, the things that we're kind of quite excited for as part of the project is coming back to those themes of secrecy. Uh, we want to hide Morse code messages in the house. Oh. Uh, Quick side note. So you know when I mentioned about the um, uh, kind of narrative notes that uh, Danny was able to use to kind of uh, add flourishes to the you know the, the interactions in the environment. This is one of those. So when Ida kind of goes internally into her mind to think about stuff, uh, the camera pulls back, uh, the characters fade out, and then um, yeah, it, it kind of gives the appearance that she's uh, shifting into her own reality. Um, yeah, sorry, as I was saying. Um, so we want to still keep the backgrounds relatively minimalist because we can hide Morse code messages in them um, and have that element of secret messages and secret codes hidden inside of the environment. Um, a, a film that is, is quite a, a good parallel to this is um, Arrival. Um, spoilers for that film if anyone hasn't seen it. Um, but as part of that uh, film, that you have the language that is learnt and that um, basically, like, as, as you learn that language, uh, your reality 
your perception of reality changes and your, your brain alters in, in the process of, of learning that language. And like with Morse, uh, we want to have it so as you learn more Morse code, you start seeing like Morse code messages hidden in the walls of the manor house, uh, in the wrought iron gates, in the, the bark of the trees, uh, you know, in, in all sorts of kind of obscure places. And you start, because, you know, as I learned Morse code, I would hear sounds in the real world, like maybe like this, like some kind of like sound of like a train um, or someone tapping or something like that. And you, you do like, in a weird way, like interpret those as Morse code. Um, so that's that's something that we, we like as an emerging theme of, of the game, like as, as it goes on, more of these kind of messages uh, manifest in the environment. So, uh, we've got the first mission coming up now, uh, but we'll have another chat to uh, uh, Eliza uh, before that. <clears throat> so, um, the illustration for the project um, was done by Katie Marshall, um, you know, who did a, a really, really fantastic job of like the kind of capturing the essence of the various characters. Um, one thing that I'm really happy with the, the project is like the level of cohesion that we've got. Um, even though like the backgrounds are like very very placeholder and kind of basic, um, you know most of the artwork was done up you know by me. It's kind of placeholder up to a point, um, but the um, the illustrations of the characters really sell it. Um, as mentioned before, Katie uh, also um, you know was involved in, in developing the custom controller. Um, so I, I basically built the. Um, original um, telegraph key, which was <laughs> a closed peg about five or six years, sorry, actually, no, it must be six or seven years ago. Um, I basically realized that uh, whilst building like a janky piano key, um, like trying to build a piano made of pegs, um, I failed at that process, but I managed to get one key working, this this peg right here. And I was like, what if, you know, this, this would actually make like a really nice telegraph key. Um, so I built a game called Dot Dot Splash, and that was like a very basic flash build that then I expanded out into um, in, into like a, a, a World War One related flash game, and that got like a, a decent amount of, of success uh, for the time that it was in flash, um, and uh, yeah, like got likes of Rock Paper Shotgun, Kill Screen covering it. Um, and you know, good. I think it was like some like 60, 70,000 plays um, online. And um, yeah, like I didn't have the, the uh, knowledge or skill at the time to be able to develop it. Um, but you know, I, I always wanted to come back to this project and develop it because I, I really love the concept for it. Um, but yeah, um, sorry, as I was saying, fr from that basic um, prototype. Uh, that, that led to the, the manifestation of the project. Um, you know, uh, me and Katie worked together to build this much more refined version of the controller, um, which, which recently was exhibited at GDC uh, in their kind of alt control um, uh, booth section, uh, which was, was a tremendous amount of fun. Uh, okay, so let's hop into our first military um, campaign. So uh, let's hide that little thing at the top. And I'm gonna just get used to these controls. So we've got these machine gun emplacements that we need to eliminate. Uh, so let's see what we can do. So on the left hand side, we've got the letter G, which is a good one to go for. So that's dash, dash, dot. So the kind of the way that I like imagine these scenarios for the game is that these, you know, you've got these kind of pivotal, like, you know, kind of small little battles that are occurring, like skirmishes, and you're just kind of applying, like, a little helpful nudge um, to try and, like, tip the scales in, in, the, in those conflicts. Um, I think a really good scale of film reference uh, in comparison to, to this uh, is, like, 1917, where we don't want to have it be that you're going to, like, pivot the whole course of the war um, but in that film you've got like a very tangible number of soldiers that are have their lives on the line um, and then a kind of personal story that develops as part of that um, another 
really great film that we discovered uh, recently, which there's a good parallel. There's one called The War Below, uh, which is about like the working class miners who um, were kind of uh, conscripted to, you know, or, or volunteered rather, uh, to dig the tunnels uh, under the German trenches and to kind of uh, master the skill of, of tunneling. Um, yeah, something I haven't, I haven't actually mentioned is uh, that Ido is, is from a working class background. Um, you know, uh, Danny, the, 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 the writer that kind of helped produce this uh, prototype, um, is, is from a working class background and you know, was able to bring a lot of her experience um, to, you know, to, to the script. You know? um, and yeah, like it's, it's you know, I'm, I'm from Sheffield in the UK. Uh, and you know, I, I like being able to kind of de not only kind of create representation around um, kind of women in computing and technology, but also um, often the, the absence of, of working class people in these te technological institutions. Um, something that, that matters to me a tremendous amount. Um, so yeah, I'm really stoked to be able to be um, designing a game which ha has like a working class. Uh, Yorkshire woman uh, as, as, the, as the protagonist, um, and as part of the game as well, um, I didn't just want to focus on um, the role of like these kind of incredibly technical roles, um, because one thing that kind of often gets overlooked uh, when we're having these discussions around uh, women in computing is that um, there's a lot of roles that existed that had just as significant or pivotal roles. Like, for example, telegraphists or um, switchboard operators. Uh, um, yeah, the, val the, the, the value of their labour was quite undervalued. Um, there's a really fantastic book called uh, Serving in a Wired World uh, by K uh, K uh, was it Katie Hin Hinmarch Watson. Hopefully, I've not mispronounced that. Um, but that's a book, a really fascinating read, which is, is all about the. Um, construction of the London telecommunications network and not only the kind of historical insights around that but also like the social uh, dynamics and like of class gender and sexual orientation like how the world was like you know, kind of or how Britain was shaped by the, you know, the structuring of these networks um, there's so many interesting stories um, one one great uh, component of it is the idea that like the labor was undervalued in the suggestion that it was uh, something that a monkey could do, that it was it was very, very basic, just pushing a button, but it was also kind of perceived as this like bourgeois, feminine uh, career where, you know, it was like pressing a piano key, kind of very uh, feminine um, kind of career. Um, and yeah, like there was like this kind of weird back and forth of, of their labour being kind of undervalued. Um, so uh, let's think back to the ballroom. Uh, the, the other one as well is the idea that the labour was undervalued, but the uh, people people were basically saying we, we, we can justify paying uh, telegraphists less, but also, as mentioned before, um, even though the, the physical labour might not have been uh, like you know, like as, as perceived as lesser. Um, one of the key things that telegraphists had was their actual ability to keep the secrets of their clients. So um, a lot of these kind of counts and uh, um, you know barons and things like that who downplayed like the value of them uh, had to be careful that they didn't say that too much or they'd have their secrets leaked because. Ultimately, um, these messages had to be relayed by people. It wasn't just machinery. Um, but pulling from books like that and, and um, really trying to kind of create a grounded, uh, oops, grounded historical setting, even though it is a fictional one, um, is something we're really, in, really interested in. Because um, there are so many kind of interesting stories from these eras to, to depict. Um, Oh, whoops. Let's uh, nip back over. I made pretty light work of these. Um, one element that I haven't kind of talked about is... Uh... Oh. 
uh, how the, the game got developed. So um, we basically got support from the UK Games Fund, which was a, um, it's a really fantastic um, organization that um, provides funding and support in kind of getting started in games development, uh, or rather um, supporting companies that are wanting to kind of take that leap in terms of getting publisher funding um, and kind of take their games beyond just like an initial prototype to a tangible product. Um, and yeah, I applied for that back at kind of late 2019 with the flash prototypes that I had um, and, you know, the kind of custom controller. And uh, yeah, we, we got funding and that kind of carried us through the pandemic. I was able to work with Katie, uh, Danny, uh, Luke and, um, and Tom. And, you know, collectively, we were able to build this kind of one hour vertical slice, um, which we're, you know, incredibly proud of. Luke did the uh, sound design, which he, I've worked with him for the last decade. He did, he did a bang up job with it. He's, he, uh, but he'd, ne he'd not actually done classical music before. Um, and, you know, personally for me, I think he's, he's done a, an incredibly good job. Uh, and then Tom uh, is, he previously worked for Inkle. Um, so the people that uh, developed Ink, um, again, good friends with him. And he kind of helped me integrate in, Ink into the project and then also uh, helped kind of do additional creative flourishes. Um, one thing I just wanted to mention whilst I'm here is you can see I've got this word onslaught here. Uh, these are the code words from the actual battlefield. So uh, I like the fact that we were able to kind of like integrate them neatly into the narrative. Um, that's something that I want to try and do as part of the, the kind of the whole campaign, like um, give the player an opportunity to find out the words in advance and, and kind of mentally prepare. Oh, so we're going to go meet Milton. Um, so, um, as you can see, this, this garden uh, is kind of the elephant in the room. Uh, looks quite basic right now. Um, and, you know, this is, again, all placeholder artwork that I've integrated. Um, and for the final game, the ambitions would be to have like a fully illustrated um, kind of 2D in a 3D environment. Um, so it, yeah, yeah, 2D assets in a 3D environment, kind of arranged in parallax. Um, I've been building games for around like a decade now, and I've always said that I would never build a 3D game until I had like an astonishingly successful 2D one. And you know, I have had some successes in my games previously. Um, like I've had a couple of million downloads like across whilst I was working in the mobile market, and. Um, yeah, this, the compromise that I came to with this was I will build a 3D game, but everything has to be 2D. Um, and I've kept the scope incredibly tight for the project to make sure that it can be feasibly delivered. Because um, as an educator, I, I've, I've worked in, um, you know, I've taught tons and tons of students, probably, probably like, 300, like 300, 400 students, and like seeing the difference in, in, in delivery of, of 3D projects versus 2D projects, it's like night and day. Um, but yeah, like the, the plan is, is to, is to get these environments fully illustrated, kind of like beautifully painted, um, still relatively minimalist, but, um, really lush kind of like doll's house setting. Um, okay. So let's, uh, nip to the ballroom. Okay, cool. So, uh, we have the approaching German army that we have to repel. <clears throat> so we'll hide this here. Um, so two things I wanted to talk about as well is um, the controls for the actual game because you know we've got this uh, quite unique input that you have two buttons that allow you to do a variety of different controls um, and you know that kind of opens the door to a, like a lot of accessibility options. So for example um, you know, the, the fact that you can have one button uh, that has 30 different inputs, um, that um, means that people that have like kind of less, kind of less control over motor skills um, will be able to kind of interact with this, um, you know, because, you, you know, you can effectively have one button. Um, there's organizations like Special Effects that exist out there. Um, that I'm really, really curious to see what they could construct in terms of controllers. Um, and, and Morse code itself has actually been used as, a, as an accessible uh, language previously. Um, I think it was Google did a 
um, a collaboration with a, a, a woman who was disabled from the neck down um, to kind of in, build a, like a language, uh, like a voice to text um, uh, Morse code translator. Um, yeah, so like taking that effectively that that language or that that tool and using it to control games with is uh, what I'm hoping to do with Morse. Um, Part of the game, I want to build a bunch of uh, kind of accessibility options because, um, you know, for example, um, let's give me a quick sec. Getting a bit spicy here. Um, uh, I want to build like a bunch of accessibility options um, because, you know, I want uh, you know people who are interested in history to be able to play this. Who, you know, not necessarily uh, kind of the conventional gaming audience. Uh, you know, I want telegraphy enthusiasts to be able to play this game. Uh, I want people who are interested in narrative, uh, you know, narrative uh, people interested in narrative games to be interested um, and, and engaged with it. Um, who don't necessarily, again, don't necessarily have the dexterity to uh, deal with some of the more stressful missions. Um, a really good example of a game that inspired the project quite quite a lot was um, Super Meat Punks. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, a game by Heather Flowers. Um, and for me, I feel like that game has a really good balance of, of, kind of accessibility and, and kind of engaging, engaging gameplay. Um, and, and yeah, like definitely inspired the game um, with its structure. Um, oops, Daisy. Oh, I won. Nice. Um, yeah, so um, the other thing with, like, you know, the, the thing that's nice with the accessibility options is uh, you can basically design it so um, you can crank the threshold meter like all the way down to very low if you have limited motor skills and dexterity, um, or you can crank it all the way to the top if you're like a telegraphy enthusiast and you're wanting to do like really, really fast input. So um, you might have seen that there was like the little cool down meter for um, the uh, kind of, uh, once you've entered Morse code, you'd get like a little threshold that would run down. Um, you could crank that up to much higher so it would run out faster and you can alter the dot dash threshold between, you know, how long you have to tap to trigger a, um, a dash rather than a dot. Um, so I want to see Morse code speedruns. That's something that maybe is, is a bit ambitious, but I think it could be done. Um, and yeah, I'd be I'd, I'd be quite excited to see what people could, um, how quickly people could beat this game. Um, <laughs> um, there's um, already been some kind of spectacles online of people dabbling in Morse code. Um, it's Rudism, the uh, streamer. Uh, did a really fantastic stream of them beating Dark Souls uh, with Morse code. Um, and yeah, like, that not only was, like, a, 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 spect a spectacle to behold, but, like, again, like, having an, a, a method of playing games like that with just one button uh, does kind of open up the door for um, kind of accessibility. It's, it's just generally very interesting to... Um, I'm just really curious to see what people come up with on that front. Uh, okay, so we've reached the end of the first day. Um, this is like uh, you know, the kind of closing out section. Um, the, the, the game basically has like um, a similar structure. It's kind of structured on like kind of a, a, a daily basis. So you have like three missions a day roughly, and then you have interspersed between them like narrative sections. So um, yeah, in the case of this where we just... Um, at the end of the day, you basically go to bed, and you have this um, these more surreal uh, kind of dream sequences. Um, so we're just going to hop into this now. So, um, as mentioned before, the game is kind of fictional historical setting, and what that gives us is the ability to have more artistic, vivid depictions of war um, and delve into the more surreal. Uh, so things like, for example, uh, poetry, uh, we want to have, um, you know, kind of poetry integrated into the game. Uh, so, um, you know, like, th th there's a lot of people like know the history of, of, of poetry in, in war, um, but 
often uh, perceived almost pacifists, uh, when in reality, like, poetry was actually used not only for pacifism, uh, but it was also used as a means of um, warmongering. So, like, you know, there was poetry drives where people would write poetry to support the troops. Uh, I think it was something like 50,000 uh, poems were um, garnered on, on the, you know, kind of, there was a poetry drive of 50,000 poems uh, in Germany to kind of support the war effort. So, um, there's a really fantastic book called uh, Everything to Nothing, uh, which delves into, like, the history of of poetry throughout the war um, yeah and, and like trying to find ways to integrate poetry into the project um, so there's that and then there's also the element of um, using these dream sequences to kind of explore uh, Ida's working class background and like how her upbringing shaped her and um, the other element as well is, is to cover um, your people that you're interacting with on the battlefield um, so for example like a lot of people have compared this game to like drone warfare and the kind of it's like a contemporary parallel and you know one of the common discussions of ethics around drone warfare is like the fact that you're so far removed from the people that you're killing uh, that you, you, you lose empathy for them so as part of the game we want to have uh, telegraphantoms which are basically like um, soldiers that have either fallen on the battlefield or um, you know, people that you've directly killed and you know, have you interact with these kind of like you know, shattered uh, you know, beings um, that have you know, been affected by you know, your actions um, to, to keep people having that connection and tether to the fact that they are affecting real lives. So we are going to nip a little bit into day two because the, the, the first mission is, is, is quite fun. So it's the other, th you know, kind of third scenario. So let's nip to the boardroom. Oh wait, no, I'm going to have my cup of tea first. <laughs> So the um, structure of the game is, is that, uh, as I mentioned, like you've got this day structure, um, but they aren't necessarily like chronological in terms of like this one after the other. Um, they're kind of spread out over the course of the war. So um, yeah, so that, that kind of gives us a little bit of freedom to kind of spread things out a little bit. Um, we're going to be doing an airplane mission next. So. So this is the third uh, type of combat as part of the game. So this is the um, uh, the biplanes. So appropriate name for the mission. Um, so there's three different kind of at the moment. There's three different mission types. So there's land, air, and sea, um, and they each kind of have their own different kind of structures to play. So um, the aerial combat, you're kind of working in the Z axis. So you're working vertically. Um, so the, the units will kind of come along quite quick, and then you'll they'll arc backwards and, and uh, the units will kind of arc backwards and fly vertically. You've got to kind of uh, try and shoot down planes and protect uh, recon units and things like that. Uh, the sea battles is uh, things like submarines, so kind of uh, hidden hidden units and um, protecting convoys and things like that. Um, and then the land battle is stuff like trench warfare. Uh, one of the things we want to hopefully get in later on, no guarantees, is like uh, tunnel warfare. So having things like destroying tunnel networks, um, uh, but having things like uh, defending trenches, 
uh, holding the line. Uh, okay, cool. I'm going to polish those up pretty quickly. Um, yeah, having having a, a bunch of different battlefields that you can interact with, um, and each having their own kind of spin on play. Um, one of the um, more ambitious things that we want to, to do is to have it so um, in later campaigns you can actually switch between channels. So I don't know if you can see it from here, but there actually is like sockets on the front of this, like a switchboard. Um, so the idea that you could have like a naval battle and a uh, an aerial battle going on simultaneously, and you ha have to like juggle the two battlefields. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so it's just like. Pfft. Uh, appearing right in your face there. Uh, apologies if my throat's a bit scratchy. Um, it was my uh, 30th <laughs> last weekend and my throat is still a little bit sore from it. back to that conversation about like um, having representation of not only people in technical roles but people um, in other roles that existed at the time um, Kitty's a really interesting character to interact with because like um, as mentioned in the kind of uh, Serving in a Wide World book there's a lot of parallels between um, people working as telegraphists and people working as servants in like the houses of like uh, you know uh, lords and and, and uh, baronesses and things like that, because both of them uh, relied on an element of discretion in kind of keeping the secrets of their, um, and there was a constant fear by the people in those positions of of their secrets getting out through their servants. <laughs> so um, yeah, it, like having having those stories told through this is is, is a really good uh, medium to do it in. I love this little interaction of. Uh, talking about the, the different types of tea and dinner and stuff like that. Um, so um, I didn't quite finish off talking about the UK Games Fund. So we basically developed that prototype over the pandemic. Uh, we had like a, a set amount of money uh, to kind of develop the project with. Uh, and that section of money ran out. Uh, and um, yeah, but, but with that, we were able to kind of deliver this one hour vertical slice. Uh, basically, the team members who worked on it since, because it's been over the course of two years that I've been, uh, in, that this has been developed over, um, I've, um, they've kind of all moved on to, to various other kind of exciting, ambitious projects. Uh, and I'm currently working with uh, producer Emily Rose to um, kind of take this, the game through this next stage. We've assembled a, a team, um, a, a team of kind of artists, illustrators, programmers to kind of take the, the game to the next level and really uh, up the production level on the project. Because um, stuff like this, you know, the space here, like that interaction there where it's saying, oh, everyone else is eating food. There is no one in there right now. So being able to actually get the, the room populated out with other officers and you know having like little tray trays and stuff like that, um, yeah, like I, I, I want that stuff to be integrated. Uh, let's go for this next mission. Uh, and within the the different, um, oh, bear with me a sec. The, the different kind of scenarios that you've got, and I'm jumping around a little bit in terms of talking about stuff, is um, you've got your land, air, and sea battles, but you have like different scenarios that play out. So in this one, you're kind of destroying supplies. So uh, let's go for. That's not what I wanted to do. Um, one little flourish that's quite cute with the um, controls is that. You know, I mentioned the cooldown earlier. You can see it kind of running down, like, at this section here. Um, if you press fire, uh, as that cooldown is running down, it, like, um, immediately fires the shot. So you can, um, as I said, hopefully we're going to have speedrunners making light work of... of ma making light work of, of gameplay. Uh, 
sort of you've got to balance destroying supplies and you know killing stragglers who are kind of running off with supplies. Uh, uh, let's go. Council one. So a lot of the shell, you know, basically like one of the important part of this game is kind of being as efficient with your shells as possible. Uh, you know, making sure that you're maximizing the damage you can do with the shells that you have. Um, so you know, rather than just hitting the, the most far along unit, maybe going for like one that's further back, but there's two of them uh, to maximize like the you know three row hits. Um, okay, let's. Uh, do this last mission. I really love these headphones, but they do get a little painful to wear after a while. Um, I love it as well that like these little switchboards kind of look like dots and dashes. Um, this is what I mean by like having all these messages hidden in the environment. Um, you know. You have Easter eggs in games, and as part of more, rather than it just being like a quirk or like a, a thing like you know, kind of a um, a fun little novelty, you know, adding deep like more thematic depth to environments through um, those messages being hidden in environments is, is something that I think would reward players who are learning the damp uh, learning the languages. Um, so, for example, this is just a hypothetical. It might end up in the game. It might not, but. The idea that, like, if there's like a really bloody battle, like something like the Somme, for example, um, you would like have after that battle, like, the, in the wallpaper, you'd maybe have the wallpaper be red, and if you like took the time to like decode it, it would be like the names of the soldiers that died in that battle, um, you know, or as the stress of, you know, Ida juggling her duties, the you know the trauma of killing people. Um, you know, or enabling killing people, and the stress of kind of hiding secrets herself. Um, you know, having elements of a personal life like manifest in the walls of the house, almost like a kind of like a telegraphy haunting. Uh, I think there's a lot that could be done there. Um, I need to be very careful here that I don't end up doing a um, <laughs> what's his name? Oh, what's the guy from Fable called? Um, Peter Molyneux. I need to make sure I don't do a Peter Molyneux and overpromise. Um, I think these are these are tangibly deliverable things, but yeah, yeah. I'm just very enthusiastic about this. Maybe a little bit too enthusiastic about Morse code, but um, hopefully we can deliver on what we've promised. affects a lot of uh, people that work in tech um, but kind of more broadly like people from like you know working class backgrounds is, is the element of um, uh, what's it called um, I, should, <laughs> I should know this word my brain's starting to fail is um, uh, I can't think what the word is oh my god um, being Basically, like not believing in yourself. I can't think what the word is. It's gone. I'm sorry. Uh, um, uh, and yeah, like in instilling the narrative with that uh, is, is, is. Oh my god, it's gonna. I can't remember what it is. It's gonna upset me, but it's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, like cre creating that sense of, of not feeling that you belong there or. Or feeling kind of out of place. Um, it's like identity. Oh, I'm going to stop because otherwise I'll just keep. <laughs> I'll keep getting caught on it. So, um, yeah, we, you know, implementing those those elements of, of 
of feeling like you, you don't belong in a place. Um, kind of common trope within games, but particularly prominent here and within like these kind of institutions that working class people aren't usually welcome in. Imposter syndrome. That's the word I was looking for. Imposter syndrome. Okay, there we go. <laughs> oh, that was bugging me. So, one thing I, I've obviously talked about, like accessibility, um, but one of the other perks of um, having just a handful of inputs to control the game with is that it means that the game can be kind of ported quite easily to other platforms. Um, you know, I think for, for, for now, uh, I would be looking at just doing the, the PC release, um, but my background was in mobile design, so, um, you know, I've got the, you know, the ambitions to bring it to um, consoles and to, to other platforms. Um, yeah, because, you know, why not? You know, the, the, if the game can control the gamepad or like a touchscreen, I'd, I'd love to get it in as many people's hands as possible. So this is quite a hard mission, this next one. <laughs> There is a whole other day left for you to kind of experience and play as part of play, um, but I'll leave you all to, to do that yourselves. Um, so let's see. This, this mission, you've got to be particularly careful with like resource management because uh, you've got a lot of units to clear up. Um, one element that we haven't discussed, um, which is something that we would love to get in the final game, is um, you've got these code words that exist along the bottom here. Um, for the most part with this demo, they're quite static. You know, you, you keep the same word for like the most of your mission. Um, but as part of like the main campaign, you like those words to be able to change uh, and, and alter like in the experience. So for example, um, let's say you're defending like a um, let's say you're defending like a trench and the word is, is, is trench as a very basic example um, but a German gas shell line lands in the back lines um, the word would then change from trench to chlorine uh, you know as, as the environment changes um, and I, I just really like the idea of like the player having to like recalibrate and um, relearn the new word that they've been kind of dealt um, and you know that can expand out to things like uh, German counterintelligence, because obviously you know, the British weren't the only ones that were developing these um, sophisticated technologies. You know, in the, in the Second World War, you had the, the likes of Enigma, uh, who were you know, which, you know, with the, the Enigma machine. Um, so, you know, having having those words getting scrambled by by German counterintelligence, so you can't just rely on the same letters over and over again. Um, you know, or as you get into deeper into German territory, having you know new letters in the forms of German uh, translations, um, like, and, and again, like the idea of like the Morse code bleeding into the real world through um, the wallpapers and, and the kind of environments of the house, but also her personal life and what's happening on the other end of the wire bleeding into. Uh, 
her experience of trying to like do her job. Um, you know, so having like words from her personal life coming into in, into the battle and kind of distracting her from doing her job. Um, yeah, I think there's there's a lot of um, narrative potential to explore with that. And, you know, from a gameplay perspective as well, um, being able to have um, missions where your the, the word changes over time or you, you're having to, like, adjust and juggle stuff, I think is, is quite an interesting concept. Um, but I guess we'll, we'll see what it can deliver. Uh, okay. So let's go to the garden for a quick chat. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, I'm really, really grateful for you sticking around and watching this. Um, hopefully I've not overfilled you with too much information. Um, but hopefully it's, um, in, you know, kind of got you a little bit interested in the project. Um, I'm very, very excited to kind of take this project forwards. Um, you should hopefully be hearing more about it as time goes on. Um, and yeah, feel free to check out the demo. Um, there's all the, all the gameplay that you've seen is available to play now on Steam. I'm hopefully going to be kind of trying to keep the game updated and, and adding more stuff to it. Um, uh, yeah, and um, thank you so much for your time. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the festival. And um, yeah, hopefully you'll learn some Morse code along the way. Uh, take care. Oh, I need to disconnect the controller. Because <laughs> it uh, confuses my computer. See you later.